We will now open the hearing on House Bill 1540, sponsored by uh, Representative Basie. Begin, sir, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, pardon me just a second here. Um, I have uh, House Bill 1540, by the way, Chuck Basie from District 47. And House Bill 1540 is um, essentially a uh, bill that was um, uh, I was made aware of after our session ended about um, special needs children and uh, their parents uh, when they go into uh, an IEP meeting or a Section 504 meeting, they would like the ability to record these uh, these proceedings. And right now, it is uh, legal in Missouri to one party consent to state to record, but all school districts in the state do not allow that uh, through policy. So. Um, um, that's in a nutshell what the bill what the bill is about. So um, now there's uh, I understand there's there's fear of litigation, um, but that happens now whether parents are reporting or not. And also there are some parents that have uh, admitted that they're secretly re secretly recording these uh, IEP meetings, and um, whether that's wrong or right, uh, whatever right. So anyway, these, these meetings are very detail oriented. There's usually um, uh, quite a few school district uh, officials in the room uh, that are involved in these meetings, and usually one parent. And um, so there's a lot of information covered at uh, some of these last hours. And um, most, if not all, of the parents that I've spoke to um, basically would just like to have this as a reference to go back and. Uh, re-listen to uh, what happened or um, oftentimes a spouse cannot attend and when they go back to uh, uh, their home they have to uh, relay of what's covered in these very detailed uh, meetings and uh, as you can imagine that, that's kind of a tall order so that is in a nutshell is uh, what it's about and um, I'm happy to answer any questions thank you representative any questions representative Chris Finelli Inquire, Madam Chair. Proceed. Uh, morning, gentlemen. Morning. So, um, I, I certainly don't oppose your bill. I, I just, I guess, I'm a little confused because we are a one-party consent state as to why it's necessary. Like, I, I don't understand what the legal ground under which a school district could deny a parent the ability to record one of these meetings. Well, a, a good question. We have some parents here that can relay their experiences, but uh, from what I understand, if a parent uh, ask for you know the ability to record uh, they either end the meeting or they don't cover things uh, in uh, in a detail that probably is is necessary so but i think there's some witnesses here that can um you know explain to you what they have encountered okay thank you for regard yes sir thanks representative morning proceed thank you Good morning, Representative. Um, a couple, I have a couple of uh, rather sp more specific questions, but I know we did get a number of letters in support of your bill, and several of the letter writers or email writers did uh, mention specific board policies in their particular districts. And I know one said that um, his district um, allowed it under certain exceptions. Another said that it was allowed, but there was like, I think maybe a week notice advance to be able to do it. So I'm wondering, do you have a, a comprehensive view of what school districts do in regard to this? I mean, do, do we know what, are there just specific districts where it appears to be a problem? Uh, do some districts have policies that allow it? Do we, do we have that information? Uh, to my knowledge, no districts in Missouri allow this uh, uh, recording to, to take place. Now, there are exceptions where um, that is allowed, but it's very rare. And uh, again, you talk about the notice requirement. I, I don't remember exactly what it is, uh, but some of the witnesses can, can convey that. Okay, and in terms of statute right now, it appears to me statute is silent on this. Yeah, I there's, think there's so. no, there's no, nothing saying it's prohibited. There's nothing saying it's allowed. It's basically silent. Is that correct? I, I think that's correct. I'm not totally sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, in in terms of your particular bill, um, sections one, two, and three, I think, are real straightforward and clear in terms of what they say. 
But can you talk a little bit more about that section four in your bill? Yeah, that's um, that's hopefully to alleviate some concerns about uh, school employees. Um, if there's uh, some something happens in one of these meetings, they, they uh, hopefully this will relieve any type of uh, retaliation against uh, a teacher or a staff member or something like that. That's the design of that. So, so if the statute, if the bill becomes law and it's in place and some teacher or school employee is in one of these meetings and it's not allowed to have the recording, then you're saying they cannot be fired by bringing it to the attention of the school board? Well, if this, if this passes, hopefully this will protect a school employee from any kind of retaliation or retribution. Okay, but, but it would be in, in terms of just the recording. I believe so, yeah. Just in terms of that. Because sure, yeah. you could talk about IEP and 504 meetings. I didn't know if it was more broadly. No, that's all just, that, the, just the, the bill is just for the IEP 504 meetings. Recording, okay. Right. And you talk about you no know, discharges or discrimination. So discharges, obviously, the person couldn't be fired. What In terms of discrimination, what are you talking about? It's kind of a broad, you know, discharge is pretty specific. Well, I think that. the language speaks for itself, so, yeah, um, it just, I think there's some fear by some teachers and staff members that uh, if they're on record, uh, audio recording, that that might lead to disciplinary action. So this hopefully will relieve that, uh, that fear. So maybe if the teacher said something the district was doing that they shouldn't be doing? Yeah, I mean, you know, is that, we all, is that kind of what you're trying to right, make, I, you're you know, I think about. Uh, we all have a tendency to misspeak on occasion, uh, you know, whether it's uh, unintentional or intentional. Uh, if, if I could kind of go a little off topic and explain my life experience, uh, I retired from the FAA, and in our uh, control environment, everything we did operationally was recorded and it was kept for 30 days and we got um, quite often we got pilot complaints that they weren't given a certain specific uh, piece of information and uh, overwhelmingly the the the, uh, the controller was exonerated when they would go back and review the tape so there's nothing in this legislation that would prohibit a school district for recording the, uh, the the meeting as well and as a matter of fact i think that would be a very good practice for them to if this does pass to implement because that way both parties would have the same information and um, then there, there should be no dispute if, Okay, and, and you may not know the answer to this, and maybe one of the other witnesses will, but one of the folks who sent an email to us said that the uh, Missouri School Boards Association has a policy tell, telling school districts not to do recordings. Do you know what that's accurate? Yeah, we, um, if we go back in time a little bit, not too long after we, I decided to take this on, uh, myself and a couple of the uh, uh, people here behind me, a couple of the mothers, um, met with Dr. Stiepelman, a member of the School Board Association, and a couple of Columbia, uh, excuse me, Dr. Stiepelman's a Columbia Public School Superintendent, and a couple of the Columbia Board members, and we discussed that, but there was just no uh, no give by the School Board uh, Association. They just are totally against this. So, and that was before we had the, the Section 4 in the bill, um, really, that idea kind of came out of that meeting. And maybe, there's, maybe, so, there's, maybe there's reasons for that that we'll find well, out. Well, yeah, I'm sure that yeah, they have reasons, but... Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate the inquiry. Thank you, Madam sure. Chair. Mr. Raising my hand to answer myself. I have a, I have a more of a, um, a statement, or I'm, I'm reading the MSBA policy um, on recording, and um, like uh, Representative Chris Finelli said, um, we are one consent state, so one party has, has to know. Uh, Reading through this, uh, were you aware that um, the uh, in, in specific circumstances, the superintendent um, or designees, I must read it, determ des designee determined in rare circumstances that such recordings are necessary. So what they're talking about is they can privately record. Say you and I are having a conversation on some whatever. We can be recorded. Inherently, that's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Um, you would actually need a, you know, uh, that's wiretapping. So, right off the bat, I see some, some other, I see a constitutional issue in this policy from the MSBA 
So the fact that we're here trying to get um, just parental rights, uh, our, our own um, one consent law that we already have in Missouri is a little interesting. So um, I don't know, we'll talk about it later, but I might offer up an amendment that the MSBA cannot violate our Fourth Amendment and uh, wiretap us without not, without knowing. So we'll talk about it later, but I might have a amendment. I just okay. saw it here, and, and I was reading through their policy. Interesting. So um, any other questions? Sorry, I interrupted. Uh, Representative Brown. Good morning. Good morning. To inquire and appoint information. Proceed, please. Uh, good morning, Representative. Good morning. Um, as the parent of two special needs children who spent 15 years going through IP meetings, I um, support this bill. My, my thought is, you know, Special School District of St. Louis County has a policy that allows this. And my guess is you just want this, these parents who need this information to be above board and not, not record underhandedly. Correct. Okay. So, have we taken a look at the special school district board policy? I was not aware of that. Okay. It's just something for us to look at as we move forward. Okay. Um, as just to set guidelines and things like that might help us out. So, thank you very much. Yeah, good information. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Representative. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Party. To a part. Proceed. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Um, I echo Representative Brown. Um, I have a student currently that has an IEP, but I have the luxury of being a school teacher and a, and a school counselor. And so the importance of, of this particular bill, I definitely understand, because oftentimes parents get a lot of master's level jargon thrown at them in these meetings, and when they want to go back to reflect, this is a, a resource for them to do so. Um, I did want to go back to section four, and as I interpreted it when I read it, it looked almost like a, a whistleblower policy in that if, um, let's say, a school district or a school employee says, well, a parent wasn't allowed to record or what have you, if they were to report that, that then their job or what have you would be um, safe. Or do, am I reading this the wrong way? Uh, I'm not sure, really. I'm not uh, an attorney, but I, that, that was kind of put in there to just protect school employees from any kind of retaliation that they might encounter as a result of the recording yeah, yeah so i guess my issue with that is 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 within the recording if something is misstated or wrong or what have you there should be and i'm saying this as a school counselor i was you know when i was employed by a school district i was employed in large part because of my expertise on the subject matter um, and in talking with people about their children, especially, and I know when I go to my, my kid's school, I don't go as Representative Proudy, I go as this, this child's parent. Um, but being a school counselor, I'm aware of some things that may be, you know, is inappropriate to be said. And if in the event that that happens, I'm, I'm coming for next. Because we are paying you for your expertise. And if you do say something wrong in these recordings, and I think that personally, um, that's a bonus in having these recordings is that I can go back and say this individual who works on behalf of the school district misspoke or said something as it relates to my child and it has caused or impacted my child's education in some way. So, I mean, if we're recording it and something is misstated or said wrong, what then happens? Well, that uh, I think that would be up to the individuals involved. Um, no, no. I could tell you how I would probably handle it. Um, I would probably, if I if I notice something at a later time, listen to the recording. I would probably go back to the school and say, "Hey, I don't agree with this particular part. I would like to have this uh, revisited or something like that." Or, but I think a lot of these parents, the fear of litigation it is. I understand that that's there, but uh, I think uh, an awful lot of these parents uh, cannot or, or don't go in these meetings looking for a reason to sue. Sure, of course. And and. Um, it would be very expensive to do that, and it could be, you know, the school districts, most of them uh, have a lot of resources, and uh, a parent does not, and it would be very expensive and time-consuming and, and not in the best interest of uh, the goal here, sure. which is the uh, education of the, of the child. So, um, th there's many other states, I didn't mention this, many other states are already doing this, and uh, I'm not aware of any problems. So. Um, 
I cannot think of a really good reason why this should not be allowed. And having said that, there's probably going to be a lot of parents that won't go in there and record anyway. Sure. And for me, you know, on the parent side and as a professional, my concern is not the fear of the teachers or the school district. I can tell you that now. That's immaterial to me when it comes to making sure that students have what they're supposed to have and that us as professionals are executing our job duties with integrity and fidelity. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I represent Chris Fennell to inquire. Proceed. I'd like to clarify a little bit sort of the exchange that you just had with Representative Prouty. As far as Section 4, my understanding of its legal effect is this. If a school district employee, as a result of a recording that was taken by a parent, reports to the administration that wrongdoing has occurred, that school district employee is not to be retaliated against or discharged. Is that your intent? That makes sense, yeah. Okay. Again, I'm not an attorney. Well, I'm half one, so that's my understanding of what that paragraph does. Not that it is some sort of immunity for the actual wrongdoing that occurred in the recording. I would be open to any amendments that make this better. I don't think you need an amendment. I think that that's what you intended to do, and that's what it in fact does, and I think we should just be clear about it before we vote on it. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Margaret. Representative Morgan. Proceed. Thank you. I'm looking at Section 2 that talks about the recording is actually the property of the parent, and then it says that no recording shall be construed to be a public record made or prepared for any public governmental body under Chapter 610. So could the recording, does that particular Section 2 prohibit someone from using that recording in a possible legal case? I would say it doesn't, but I'm not sure. I don't think so. Okay, I just wanted to know your opinion on that. So someone, so that would not necessarily, someone still could use that recording in a legal case? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative Dogan. To inquire. Proceed. Thank you. I appreciate you clarifying one of the points you made earlier. You said it was your intention to have the schools also be able to record the item. Oh, absolutely. I think it would be a good practice for them to do that. Okay, because when I had a private discussion with you about this, I think, I'm guessing we'll hear later from representatives of the schools that one of the reasons they're kind of hesitant on this is that it might conflict with kind of federal privacy law with FERPA. And the goal of that law, I would guess, would be to try to protect parents from their kids identifying information or any other kind of confidential information from getting out there and being a public record. So I think it's important that you have that section in there saying that nothing that the parent would be recording would be considered a public record. But I think you would have to probably, if you do intend to allow the school districts to do this also, you'd have to make sure that that checks out with federal law. And then also just provide, from my perspective or from a parent's perspective, just a little bit more fleshing out of what the schools can and can't do if they intend to record and just making sure that everybody's privacy is respected there. Okay. I think we have an attorney here that might be able to address that. Okay. So I think she's here. Also, I do appreciate the intention of what you're trying to do here. And, you know, I think it's fully warranted. And I'm just kind of surprised that parents would be treated in that way by their school districts. Thanks for bringing this forward. Representative Crowdy. Quick statement, if I may. So parents aren't subjected to 610 in that manner. And so, but they do, in a legal case, have the right to forfeit the records that's of their choosing. Those records belong to them. And as far as FARPA, if it was recorded by the school, even if it wasn't recorded by the parent, it is covered under FARPA. It would still be considered an educational record. If a parent chooses to self-identify or identify their children, that's their right to do that. The schools can't. 
So it would still be covered under FERPA and would be treated as a regular education record that parents, even if they didn't record it, school districts recorded it, parents could request that school record as they would other um, school records. So I hope that that sort of eases that. So even though it's not explicitly stated in this bill, it would still be covered under FERPA if the, if the school district recorded it and subjected to that. And as far as parents and what they do with the information, you know, as it being their property, is their right to do with that property. Um, so we couldn't sunshine request a recording from a parent, obviously. Um, that's not how, how that, they're not government agencies or, or anything, you know, someone say, hey, we need this. And of course, if it was subject to a lawsuit, you know, depending on what it is, necessary redactions would take place. So it is still covered under federal law as far as educational records and things of that nature. Thank you. Any other questions, Representative McDonald? To inquire. Proceed, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Representative. Good morning. I, I like the the open meeting aspects of, of, of this bill. I mean, these are public entities, and the more daylight we put on them, the, the better. The, I think a big part of what we do here versus, say, the, uh, um, you know, where we, we go out and get petitions signed and we put something on the ballot is we, we can look as a group at unintended consequences. And so one of my concerns, one of my unintended consequences, I, I get where you're going with a parent recording a, a meeting, but I'm, I think I'm partly concerned about the use after the fact of that, that video, the use of it for political purposes. I would guess 90 plus percent of um, you know, our school boards are elected, and I, I've seen um, bootlegged, I guess is for lack of a better word, videos of um, some of those meetings used against school board members for political purposes, and I, I just have some concerns yeah, about um, that, that route. I think we would be, the people that I'm advocating for on this, I think we'd be fine with taking that video part of it out. But I think the intention was this was audio recordings. And if I could add one other thing I didn't mention earlier, um, since this kind of hit the, uh, the Columbia media market, I've had uh, quite a few individuals just uh, in different settings that have already, their kids are grown and gone, but uh, they, they said they would have loved to have this ability to record IEP meetings. And, and not one person has, has indicated that they would like this for the ability to litigate. No, I mean, it's, it's all mainly for review purposes or, um, like I said, a spouse not being able to come to these meetings. And um, when I first heard about it, I thought these were 15 minutes long or so, something like that. And uh, many of these parents said they're hours long. One lady told me hers went six hours. So if you can imagine trying to gather all that information, take notes, try to think of questions as you're proceeding through there, and then going back and relaying it to a spouse, uh, that's just impossible. You know, I, I agree, agree completely. You could put me in that camp as well as a parent of, of former public school students. It would have been nice to just be able to see what's what's going on at that level and not have to, to attend at, at the school board's convenience. So I, I'm completely on board with that side. But like I said, I'm just concerned about uh, unintended yeah. consequences yeah. And, and how we can protect against that. Yeah, that's, right. That's, that's and I, I did point. notice that video part in there last night. I, I don't think that was the intent we had to uh, didn't, I might, I might be wrong, but I, I think our intent is just to have it audio recordings available only. So, very good point, though. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? All right. Uh, so now we will hear any uh, witnesses um, in favor of. But let's go back and forth. We'll do support and then opposition, support opposition. Um, so you can call your the first. Witness to come up and uh, make sure you fill out the uh, witness form, please. Thank you. Um, I actually have a printout of the policy that Columbia Public Schools, as well as uh, this is what MSPA. We'll just your name too. I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. Sarah Rivera. All right. Thank you. Um, um, so I have a copy for everybody that shows what MSBA's policy on recording is, and it's also what Columbia, Columbia Public Schools has. Can you hand that to me? Good morning, good morning, Chairwoman and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Rivera, 
Rivera, and I have two sons, one of whom has autism. First, I'd like to explain to those who may not know what an IEP and 504 are. An IEP, or Individualized Education Program, is created through collaborative teamwork between school staff, parents, students, and supporting agencies. It is represented in a legal document format, but it is a dynamic process, not just a file folder. The IEP is made of goals, services, accommodations, and modifications that students need to achieve their optimal outcomes. 504s, thus named because students' rights to have accommodations is addressed in Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, provide accommodations that allow students access to their education that may not need the more in-depth modification of an IEP. Both documents are created to ensure academic success of the student. When my son was diagnosed with autism three months shy of his third birthday, I had little to no knowledge of autism. I knew of the existence of special education, but had no idea what an IEP or 504 was. I had never experienced the mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion these meetings would take on me. Two weeks after he was diagnosed, I found myself sitting in my first IEP meeting. I didn't even remember what the teacher had called it when he called to schedule the meeting. Therefore, I walked into it with zero preparation for what it would entail. I honestly thought it was for the teachers to tell me about the curriculum and to complete registration forms for my son to attend the school. The teachers and school staff were wonderful. They explained everything, and in the moment I understood what they were saying. But the emotional toll it took as I sat and listened to all the ways my son was behind, the things he couldn't do, and in this new life I found myself in, I was left wondering if he would ever do them. By the time my husband and I walked out of that meeting, we were so overwhelmed by the whole process and the steep learning curve we were on, we couldn't remember much of what the discussion was. All we had to go on was this piece of paper that seemed to be written in Greek. It wasn't anyone's fault, it's just the way these meetings are. I wish I would have had a recording that I could have listened to in the days to come. Fast forward to today. I have learned a lot about autism and special education. I know a lot of the jargon now. We have been in seven IEP meetings, filled out countless evaluations forms, and attended hundreds of therapy appointments and you know what? It's still not possible for me to stay 100% focused when somebody is telling me that my son can't do something. Because when I look at my son, he's perfect. He's smart and funny and loving, and he amazes me with his strength and how his mind works putting together connections I never would. Then I go into an IEP meeting, and so much of it is focused on his deficits, on everything he can't do, and you start to wonder, what if he never learns that skill? What's going to happen in his future? What if, what if, what if? We need to be able to record these meetings so that when we get home and the emotions fade, we can go back and listen to, with a calm mind. There is so much presented and discussed in these meetings that it is easy to miss something. Personally, we have lacked childcare during every single IEP meeting and had to bring both of our sons, um, causing us to be distracted at times. Days and weeks later, when something comes up and we need to refresh our memories or of the conversation around a specific accommodation, um, if we had a recording, we could save ourselves and our teachers time trying to figure it out. Let's be honest, our teachers are as exhausted as we are. I would also use a recording to help me prepare for the following year's IEP as it approaches. And one of the biggest reasons that I need to have these meetings recorded is because when my son turns 18, he is supposed to run the IEP meeting without me. My son doesn't like being in the room when we discuss his IEP. He hates being the center of attention. A recording would allow me to introduce him to the IEP process little by little at home where he is most comfortable in a manageable way. And even if he was willing to sit in the meeting currently, he wouldn't be able to process the information presented fast enough to meaningfully participate. Recording an IEP meeting ultimately needs to be allowed because it's the greatest benefit to the student for whom we should all be helping we should all be working to help. And after all, it's their education we're talking about. And I also wanted to add to this testimony, just addressing the retaliation part that um, you had brought up. Last year in my son's IEP meeting, um, there was a part of his IEP that I greatly disagreed with. And there was one school staff who was adamant it had to be in there. And so I went around and I talked to all of his teachers, his therapists, his learning specialists, Everyone, I said, am I wrong? Is, does this need to be in the IEP for him to get everything that he needs? 
And they all said, no, we don't even see this as being a thing with him. It, it doesn't make sense to us that it's even in there. And I said, okay, great. So I know that I, it's not just me. It's just this one person who disagrees. So in the IEP meeting, nobody spoke up to be in support of me. And it felt like, because I love my son's teachers and therapists, they're all wonderful and they all love him. But I felt like they were afraid to speak. And I think a recording would have helped that. Thank you. Any questions from the witness? Representative uh, Prouty. To inquire. Proceed, please. Good morning. And thank you for your testimony. I, um, I've been there, so that was the reason I asked the question and, and being afraid to say something, but telling you, you know, this doesn't sound quite right. And in my experience as a middle school counselor, I've definitely experienced that. Um, and in as much and as an, an advocate for parents, especially when it comes to special needs and special services or ancillary services, et cetera, um, and I'll also say it's different when you're a school counselor and you're a parent and you go to an IEP meeting. It's remarkably different when you're a state representative and you go to, to your kids 16, which is the transition, um, when they're getting ready to transition out of IEP um, to go on and go forth out of high school. It's very, very different. But as a parent and as a school counselor, I know that if I don't want something on my child's IEP, it does not go on the IEP. It so going very good, very good. So any parents in here, if you don't think anything should be on your child's IEP, you absolutely have a right to tell your team that it does not go on there. Okay? So that's first off. And it's many things I took off my kids, like he doesn't get a timeout room and 50 minutes of this, like we're not doing that. So any you can tell them no. Just want to get that out there. Um, on the handout you gave us, it says recording of meetings, the Board of Education prohibits. The use of audio, visual, and other recorded devices at meetings held pursuant to the IDEA Act, or the um, IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disability Act, or Section 504, as well as other meetings amongst district employees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then it goes on to say exemption, exemptions to this prohibition will be made only in accordance with board policy and law. And interestingly, in Missouri, it is law for you to be able to record, um, and it is your child. Um, and it says this prohibition does not apply to conversations held within the view of district security cameras, so they can have the recording, you can, which is very interesting that they put that um, like that. And then it goes on to talk about um, how it prohibits secret recordings of meetings um, where persons involved do not consent to the recording. However, again, in Missouri, you still have that. And it's funny how this board policy appears, um, because I'm not a lawyer, a teacher, it does appear to be in conflict with, with state law. Have you ever challenged this or in, have you had any experience with, you know, I am going to record it, you're not, you know, because it's not like federally we can say, well, we're not going to have the meeting, because federally we still have to have the meeting if you're like, no, I'm going to record it anyway. Is, have you had that experience? I personally have not. Um, there are others here who have, and I think are going to testify. To Very good. I look yeah. forward to to hearing that. I'm just it's it's interesting how boldly stated this is in opposition to our actual state um, state law. And so I, I agree with you. I've been there where teachers have you know I don't know if this has to be in here and. You know, when the parent was like, well, didn't you say, and then because it's not written or recorded, the teacher's like, I don't know what you're talking about, or I didn't say that, you know, you know, that. So I definitely felt that when you said it. Thank you for sharing. And is this the 16-year-old, the or your, oh, my 16-year-old, but your kiddo? Oh, sorry, my son is uh, in second grade. Oh, he's a little kiddo. Yeah, he's. He's going to be eight this summer. And I do regret um, on behalf of, of educators that, and it does seem like at IEP meetings, it centers in on, on all of the deficits your, your student has. And again, it's, it's very different. This is the first IEP meeting I had for my kid since being elected. How you would think he was, he just was the best kid on the, <laughs> on the planet when it, it just, it is different. So as a parent, having sat on that side of the table or as a school counselor, I definitely understand and I, I regret that you've had that experience so far and I hope that this body this year is able to provide you some, some help. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions? Representative uh, Stacy. Yes, just to say I wanted to thank you for coming down here and so well expressing uh, your concern and how uh, things have worked out for you and your son. 
I think uh, your example has given us good reason to uh, uh, give weight to this uh, process and certainly uh, maybe uh, get this this bill across the aisle. So thank you for, for well stating your, your position. Thank you. thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you so much. Uh, anyone here to testify in opposition? <coughs> no? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Basie and uh, members of the committee for allowing us to come this morning and share. Um, though I sit here testifying, uh, I'm Phyllis Wolfram. Thank you. Uh, I am the Executive Director for the Missouri Council of Administrators of Special Education. Uh, we have approximately 600 members across uh, the state of Missouri. And though I sit here in front of you and say I'm testifying in opposition, what I do want to say to you is that our membership is truly struggling with this issue. As educators, we want all parents to have meaningful participation in all IEP meetings and participate as equal partners in the educational decision making about their child. We want the opportunity to dialogue, to celebrate successes, and to problem solve together. Today, um, I've heard many of the parents that are going to speak today speak in Columbia Public Schools. As we've done some informal surveying across the state, this seems to be kind of isolated in that area as far as the issue that they are having right now. And if all parents would use the IEP recording, as you will hear the parents share today, we would have absolutely no problem. But that's something that we can't guarantee, and it's probably not very realistic. I know you're struggling with the issue of um, board policy is violating uh, the rights of others, but I believe that um, not being an attorney, we probably need to look further to what the authority of a local school board is. Um, again, I'm not an attorney, but I just, I believe that when those policies were developed many years ago, when this was an issue, that had to do with the local school board having that authority. So I would just encourage us maybe to go a step further and check that out. We know that um, should this pass, it will require additional processes and procedures for school districts. Um, they'll be required to maintain those recordings as part of the student's educational record. Um, should they be used in any type of legal proceeding, and it's probably been 20 years since this was a major issue in, in public education. Um, I am working in my 37th year in, in the field of special education. And again, it's not an issue from a legal perspective right now, but it has been. And I think that's our fear and our underlying fear that um, teachers will feel like they're in gotcha moments when we end up in due process. And those recordings have to be transcribed. Um, it's also my understanding that authentication, that it was even a real, that the recording has not been tampered with, would be a, a huge financial burden for the school district and only take away resources from children. I don't know if there's ways to, in legislation, prevent that from happening in legal proceedings. I think they're not, but I think that's a question, again, for our attorneys. Um, I think that when the last section of the, the bill um, to protect teachers, I think is important because every school district is um, functions very differently. But what I do know is the number of teachers that I've worked with over the years and from across the state, um, they feel stifled and they feel like recording sometimes limit the conversation. Uh, general ed teachers and special ed teachers are sometimes afraid that their words, if they do misspeak, and as you said, sometimes we misspeak, that our words will be used against us. Um, and, and we want all teachers and all parents and all students to feel safe in our school system. So um, I thank you today for allowing me the opportunity to share those concerns uh, moving forward. Um, you have a tough job. Any questions for this witness? I just want to make a comment. Um, according to my wife, I, I misspeak a lot. <laughs> oh, that's it? 
that was the comment? Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any others to testify in support of? Come on down. Good morning. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Victoria Rollins Ballou. I am a former uh, special education teacher and administrator. I now am a consultant and I work with families and school districts both in the areas of Section 504 and special education. So, given my history, um, you know, I did a lot of soul searching whenever all of this came up. I am in support of being able to record these meetings. I know from experience on both sides of the table. The discussions that go on are highly technical. They are include everything from education to social emotional behavior and many other things that just you cannot possibly remember afterwards. Speaking as a former teacher, there's been many times I finished up a meeting, gone back to finish and write up the IEP and make changes to it and I looked at my notes and I really wasn't positive that I got it right. I, that's, that's the honest truth. So I would call a parent or I would call and I would ask, wait, what did we say about that? Did we go ahead and put that in there? It's honest mistakes. As um, an advocate and a consultant sitting on the other side of the table, it's very emotional for these parents. They're sitting through meetings, they're talking about their child, um, whether it's their first IEP meeting or their 20th. And there's just no possible way when you're sitting there with seven or eight people across the table talking about one of you, the most valued things in your life that you can possibly remember what is said. And if you don't understand something, you can ask, but a lot of parents, are, they forget before it even starts again. So the opportunity to record these meetings, go back, look at them, uh, listen to them, sorry, you might look at a recording, uh, listen to them and revisit these issues, I think is vitally important. So both, oh well, I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, I'm a former teacher, I'm a former administrator, I'm a consultant, and I'm an advocate for children with special, special needs, and I fully support this. Thank you so much. Um, as, a, as a mom of a, of a kiddo that has autism, uh, diagnosed at age three, now that we're, this is bringing back a lot of memories, Honestly, I don't think I heard anything in an IEP till like three years later. I mean, I was devastated. I was in denial. I was um, grieving. I was going through all those stages that a lot of parents go through when um, you get news like that. So um, I appreciate uh, what you're saying and, and, and supporting this. Um, and, you know, as far as a uh, burden put on the school district or whatever for paperwork or or um, transcribing or anything like that. I think as a mom, I can say, um, tough. I mean, I don't know, there's some about moms with kiddos of, that has disabilities or issues or tough as nails and we don't give a flying hoot about making copies or um, transcribing and doing a little extra work. We send our kids to school to um, learn and we appreciate the help. My, those teachers I've had are angels, I call them all angels. I don't know what they did or how they did it, but they got my kiddo talking and I mean, he's 12 now, he's awesome. Um, I'd have him, any, no, no other way, he's fantastic. But um, they do a great job and the alphabet soup is, is hard. Like I said, I don't remember the first three years of it because I was just like stunned. But, um, but anyway, so thank you so much. Any other questions for this witness? Alrighty. Um, another, any other uh, testimony in opposition? Any more to, in favor of? And don't forget to fill out witness forms too. Thank you. Hi. Okay, my name is Michelle Roboto. I'm actually going to hit Jacob up to pass out a bunch of stuff for you guys. Mine is not as, uh, as, um, more <laughs> My name is Michelle Romano. I actually have three kids. I have one that is 16 on an IEP, so we're just starting that, all those transition things, um, which is scary. And um, I have a uh, typically developing 14-year-old, and I have an 11-year-old with a 504 plan, so I kind of get uh, both, both sides. Um, 
So I just want to give you a few facts about recording of these um, IEP and 504 meetings across the country. This is not a new thing. This is not something that Missouri has suddenly decided that, oh, these parents want to record. I mean, this is something that is typical through, um, through both of, you know, across the country. Basically, 88% of the country allows recordings. And a lot of them, it's just, I just am having a difficult time understanding why it is become such a big deal and why there's so much opposition. Um, but let me just step back a bit. I know you guys have talked about the one party versus two party. And as you know, 37 states are just like us, one party, 13 or two party. Um, but what I think is really interesting is of those two party consent states, nine of them felt it was important enough to actually go and give the parents the right to record. So the, either through legislation or the Department of Education was strong enough to say, no, this is something that's important. And especially in a two-party consent state, I'm sure that's a, it's a much bigger issue there because both parties would need to consent. Now going to the one-party consent states, um, most of them are silent, you know, so they go to their wiretapping laws and then there's no board policy that excludes it. So it's, you know, if it's allowed, I have some um, friends, you know, now with Facebook, you can keep in touch with everyone and ask them what would happen if a parent recorded, they said we'd record. They just didn't, didn't understand the big deal. Um, four states that are one party have um, adopted policies. And then um, six one-party consent states have stepped forward also and thought it was important enough to either make through uh, the Department of Education or through legislation to say, yes, parents should record. So what I, what I passed out to you guys, there's two sheets. One is a copy of an IEP that is redacted, just so you can kind of see what that document looks like, because unless, I mean, I know a lot of you have dealt with that, but just so you can get an idea. Um, the second is, um, breakdown of each state and how you can see where they fall on recording not recording um, there are the three outlier states wisconsin is kind of all over the board they're one party but yet some schools allow it some schools don't alabama is very similar to us the, they have an organization kind of like msba that has put out policy not everyone has a, it used to be everyone adopted it schools are starting to buck the system now um, but in our great state um, we do have two agencies that have put out these policies that are adopted by the majority of this of the um, of the state. So, um, so really, it's just one of those things where um, I'm hopeful that Missouri will join those other um, nine states that have stepped up and said it's time to put this in writing to make sure it can't be taken away. Now, I know you'll hear opposition. I'm sure as it gets spread further and further. Um, you're going to hear all these problems about how it's going to cause um, a multitude. I mean, you've heard some of them, but if it was really that big of an issue and that difficult, then 88% of the country it wouldn't wouldn't be happening. Um, recording has just become a part of our daily lives. There's police body cameras, dashboard cameras mounted on your vehicles, apps on our phone that track activity, security cameras in buildings. Um, my calls to the service companies are being recorded for quality assurance and public schools are continually monitored and recorded. So when I walk in, they can track my, they track me through the whole thing. Um, and school board, we, we can go back and listen to those meetings. So we're only asking for an honor recording of meetings that are the backbone of our children's education. In some cases, the IEP is so in depth that it is truly the entire child's education. So these meetings are also a way that our children have access to equitable education. Our teachers are professionals and they are very prepared for these meetings. And they should be trained and confident in their ability to host these meetings. So yes, change is hard, and if you're not used to being recorded, it will be a little weird at first, but that just quickly goes away, as any of us who've had a job that is recorded to find out. It's just not a big deal after a bit. I've actually been in several recorded meetings through ADA accommodations, and I, there was really no difference, you know, even having discussions ahead of time where people were like, I'm a little nervous, but, it ended up being just a, a, the regular um, IEP meeting. Um, one thing that we have been hearing a lot of is teacher retention, because that is a concern. Um, but teacher retention is a concern throughout the entire United States. If it was just because of recording, then Missouri would not have a problem because we don't allow recording. So I just really feel like teacher retention is not something that we can um, attribute to that. 
Um, instead, I feel like teacher pay, testing standards, curriculum demands, decreased planning time, large class sizes, standards reference gradings, lack of support, those are the things that, um, that cause teacher retention issues. And in fact, my school district was sued by the teachers union this past year. You know, teachers shouldn't have to sue their school district to get decent wages and support. So it's comical to me that now school districts are coming out saying that this is going to cause these troubles, these parents are going to cause this problem just because we want to record a meeting for our children. Um, I just think I have to pass them over. So. Thank you. Questions? Representative Stacy. You may be able to answer this, or there may be some of my committee members that can answer this. This, this actually is the first one of these IEPs that I've looked oh, at. Okay. So uh, my question is, um, is this a is this a pretty much a standard form that uh, all school districts would? I, I know IEPs are standard, but this this presentation would would I expect to see this in, in St. Louis and Kansas City and. and uh, Branson or wherever I, I was, a s similar kind of uh, presentation? Yes, for the most part. So um, Missouri DESE will put out um, kind of what, the, what they recommend. Schools are allowed to revise it, but it still has to have every single one of those components. So they're not allowed to take out sections. But So in essence, when you pick up an IEP, you'll be able to find the section that you're looking for, no matter what's, what other district you're in. Okay, so I could expect this anywhere in the state, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Right. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Representative O'Donnell. To inquire. Proceed. Um, I'm looking at your uh, recording by state summary, and you've got this broken out by one party consent and two party party consent. I, I guess maybe to to help with some of the, the resistance um, that we're hearing, obviously the parent recording would be the one the one party. Are there any, any states that have it that not necessarily consent, where the school district would have to would have to allow it. And that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to, to, to have them allow it, but at least so that they know that it, that it isn't being recorded clandestinely, or somebody's looking for a stump the chump moment in, in a recording. Just for do you, are any states structured like that, where it's like one and a half as opposed to to one or two? So you're saying that they. Um they say that yes, you can record, or you're no, not, not not permission necessarily from the school district, but where they want to really, do it. really uh, letting them know that you are recording is um, no, yeah, notification. Yes, um, they have different notification requirements um, because they like to be prepared. And most schools, when when someone's recording, they are going to record also just to protect themselves, which I fully recommend. Um, but in terms of, I think we are going to have someone testify who worked at a district where it was just common practice that they recorded everything, and it was just their policy, and that's kind of how they protected. Um, so I think you'll hear from some people that worked in districts that did that. Um, so you know, and that's up to the school. If that's if that's um, something that would help. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Thank you. Anyone else in opposition? Thank you. No. Uh, in favor? Hi, I'm Robin Shelp. Um, my son has some papers. He's going to pass that after he does my camp by photo moment. Um, <laughs> so I just want to hit on some of the questions that have been asked. I don't really have anything prepared. First, I want to step back and just say, oh, I'm with Missouri Disability Empowerment. And in March of 2019, parents in Columbia connected and decided to ask the board, their school board, to change. And that's what's kind of prompted this legislation. Um, and there was a comment made that um, it's only a CPS thing, it's local. No, let me just say the parents connected. And that is very hard as a special ed parent to connect with other special ed parents because you are in a really challenging time. And schools don't tell you who else has IEPs like you because that's confidential. Um, in some of our classrooms that are district classrooms, we can't even go to the class, the Christmas party because then we would know which other kids have IEPs. I mean, that is how isolated it can be as a special ed parent. So it's very hard to get together. When we started doing this, we had parents from other places reach out. Just last week, I talked to a mother from Houston who said, I want to record. And I said, you need to find other parents and go to your school board. We need to put pressure on school boards. And she said, I can't do this alone, and I don't know other parents. So this is not just a CPS issue. It's just that CPS has had the pressure. And I also want to say the parents have had retaliation as a result of what we have been doing. And it's hard as a parent to fight for something when you know that you're going to do that. Um, 
a school administrator, a school leader, sent out a letter to, parent, to the teachers in our district saying, we are so sorry that you are being attacked by these parents, but we're on your side. So we were called out for attacking by going to school board meetings and advocating for our kids simply to follow state law and let us record. Um, so it's not been easy, um, and I am thankful that Representative Basie stepped in and said, hey, let's go ahead and push this. That's why we have to fight for this. I'm not a big government, let's, let's make policies at this level to control our schools, but when the schools aren't doing what they're supposed to do, then someone needs to step in and protect the parents. Um, I do appreciate this legislation doesn't put a lot of boundaries on it. It simply says you can't prohibit. You have to follow the law. And so I do think it would be a great idea to go and look, you know, when schools decide to sit down, once this gets passed, if it's passed, to write their policies, then they are going to need to look at like what St. Louis is doing in other places. But the schools will have the ability to write their own policy to fit their needs. They simply can't prohibit recording. Um, another thing that's important is this only, it doesn't require the school to record. The school does not have to record the meeting if they don't want to. Um, so the whole idea of maintaining and this is just too much, they don't have to. No, they can, and like Michelle said, I would recommend that they do. And so what we have put together is we sat down with ITs, with special administrators. We put together um, a form on second page tells you what it would cost. We've been told, oh, our district says it's going to cost $700,000 a year to do this. We said, oh, funny, but G Suites for Education allows teachers to store data for free, unlimited data, and it is FERPA, in FERPA compliance. So I'm really having a hard time with $700,000. We're talking four to five terabytes in a district the size of Columbia. That, that's not that much money. Um, and so we, we put together, we also gave you a possible policy. This isn't what you have to do, but if you're having a hard time seeing what this might look like, there's a policy. Um, so I think that's important. And, you know, another, I gotta say though, I'm gonna just pause for a second. I am shocked that only one person spoke in opposition because we have had way more people speak in opposition in Columbia on this issue. And I know you're gonna hear it. So I do ask if, when you hear the opposition, I'm disappointed they didn't come and say it publicly. But when they do say it to you, I hope you'll reach out to us because we probably have an answer for you. Um, but one thing, um, that one of the teacher unions asked us is, doesn't your IEP have everything you need? That is the, it is a legal document that has to be followed. Yes, very much so. The IEP has what I need. But that's like saying that the summary of um, the committee that goes online is all you need instead of hearing this whole discussion. No. The IEP meeting is the discussion. It's like the novel. The IEP is like the clip notes. And parents need access to, to the meet, to the questions, to the discussions around what happens in the IEP. And just, I mean, I just look at the layers of how this could help. If you have a child who's in foster care, who's moving from family to family, this allows the, the new family and new teachers that get this child to understand what's been happening. Instead of, here's a piece of paper, good luck. It's confusing. Um, so there's so much meat to this. And I know there's questions about what about the social media aspect of this? What if this gets posted? That kind of thing. Keep in mind, parents can secretly record already. So that could already be an issue. So I think it's great that the school would say, hey, we're going to openly record and we're going to have our own copy. So that if this does go to litigation, so this does go on social media, we have our copy that's undoctored or that we think it's a protection to teachers. Um, and then the last thing, in the answer to the retaliation, I have sat at an IEP meeting run by the school psych who went over the test results. She's met my son for two hours, spent two hours with him. His teacher, his SLP, who have worked with him for five years sitting there, and they were silent when the school psych said something completely wrong, silent, about his test results. And I walked out and I said, what just happened? That's wrong. And they're like, I know, I can't believe she said that. They can't say anything. There is a hierarchy. It's not spoken of. One of the teacher unions admitted there said, I'm glad you're doing this. There's a hierarchy. And it is not in favor of our kids. We have got to put something in place so that my son's teacher can say, um, that is not okay to tell that mom that her son's IQ must be so low that you can't test it. Go back and test it. It should be me saying that. It should be my son's teacher who knows the law. Because Fortunately, I know the law, and we got it retested. But most parents would walk out of there and go, okay, 
I don't know what I can do. Um, and so we have to have teachers empowered to be able to say what they need to say. So I think that covered most of the questions that were kind of floating. Any follow-up? Uh, Representative Brown. To inquire. Proceed. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. I have three questions. First of all, did I hear you say that parents can't attend a Christmas party? Yes. In fact, we have to leave. <laughs> if your child goes to the ECSE preschool, you can't even get into the classroom. They, the teachers walk into the classroom because you can't see who's there, which is really ironic with the Christmas party because my son's, when my son was, we pulled him because the self-contained district segregated classrooms just were too much for me. I needed him to be integrated. Those kids sit at their own table in the lunchroom. So we all know who's got the IEP. But yeah, that is an issue. We're fighting lots of issues. Okay, and can you give me an example of retribution towards parents? Yeah. I, I thought I heard you say Right, that. so like I said, um, so we had, um, we had a, a board meeting on a Monday. Parents came up, they spoke in support of this. They brought in a couple other organizations. I think one was here and the other was MSBA to speak against it, um, to really get a feel for the policy. Um, on Friday of that week, a letter went out to teachers from two very high up people saying, um, we know that we apologize, basically an apology saying that parents are, are attacking. I think it, they even said like there was like a war against the teachers. That immediately put every parent on the defense. We had to go to the teachers and say, please no. I am your ally. I think you are amazing. You're doing a great job. I am not attacking you. I am attacking a policy that doesn't go with state law. So that's the kind of thing that we are feeling. How did the teachers react when you went to them? So I personally did not, that, when I say we, they, um, my son is part-time in school because he's homeschooled. And the parents were very, the teachers have been very supportive. Um, they have told us we can't get publicly support this. Um, there was this anonymous, or, it's just been really weird, but um, they have they have understood. I think most of us have really good rapport with our teachers. They know why we want to record, they understand that. Um, but just to have that kind of, I don't know, it's just been really received negatively. Um, okay, last question. You said that you were surprised at the lack of opposition testifying. Mm -hmm. Can you give examples of other opposition? Yeah, MSBA, we have been going at it with MSBA over this. We asked them about the question, why can a, a principal secretly record a meeting, or a superintendent secretly record a meeting he's not at? That doesn't seem to be lawful. Um, we've had back and forth emails. We sat down with CPS with MSBA and had conversations with them. They came to a board meeting. Um, they have, I don't want to use the word that they use, but it just hasn't been good. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Representative yeah. Prouty. I'm not sure um, if I'm going to inquire or sort of fire off, so I won't ask to inquire. I just, I'm an educator. I'm a union educator. Um, above all, I'm a parent. And if I had to leave this job behind my child, I absolutely would. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around, so I'll re-ask what Representative Brown asked. Someone employed by the school district sent a letter to people that work at the schools that contends or claims that taxpayers of a school district that pays the salary of these individuals through their taxes were attacking them? Yes, the and it can, it's a letter that can be sunshined. I don't have a copy. I, I, I'm, I, I think I'm going to do that this afternoon. It, the word attack was used. Um, help me out. Someone's going to pull the letter up. What's that? Smear? Smear. It, oh. was, it was a pretty harsh letter, and it was, when you see it and you see who it's sent, you'll see, and it was, and I'm not trying I know I'm throwing them under the bus, and, and my apologies. No, no, ma'am, you, that's not my tax, plan. you my, are a taxpayer, and you are entitled to hold My point is that it is not easy as a parent to advocate for this change. Parents need this. Um, my husband even asked me last night, oh, tell me again why you're fighting for this, that the law allows it. Is it because parents don't realize they can fight and they can still record? And like you said, um, legally, yeah, I can set that recorder on. And, you know, the sticky thing for the teachers is, if I was having a conversation with one of you and I brought the recorder and you could walk out of the room, 
because you don't want to be recorded. That's the beauty of the one-sided recording. Um, and I could secretly record it, and that would be perfectly legal. The problem with an IEP meeting is the second I put it there, that teacher can't walk out of the room because it is a legally required meeting, and they have to have it within a year. Um, so it puts our teachers on the spot, and our district will stop a meeting. It will cancel it. Someone's going to testify in a second the ramification. Because the meeting wasn't held, FAPE is not being honored because she can't go on to school that she needs to go. I mean, like, it is really shocking some of the stuff happening. Um, I'm on the edge of my seat about this. This Again, as an educator, I'm going to apologize because that is, in my opinion, is highly inappropriate. Again, and I can only have this job if I am a tax-paying voter, right? That's a requirement at a minimum for this job. I vote on a state budget, right? I, I can't imagine, you know, a, a government funded entity telling its employees that are paid through your tax dollars that you are smearing or attacking them. And I'm going to say this on the record, that was highly inappropriate <laughs> and should not have taken place as a union educator. Right, and I will say that we were told it wasn't about us, and the other group that was arguing for something else was told it wasn't about them, and we know who it was about. It was it, it, about that's just, not yeah. So anyways. Okay, thank you. And I, again, apologize that the, the letter even occurred. And my point, again, my point isn't to throw them, it's just to say retaliation happens when we try to advocate for this. Chairman Basie, you have something? Oh, I just, uh, I just wanted to uh, make a quick announcement uh, so everybody knows. We have one other bill after this one, uh, House Bill 1568. That's right. Um, anyway, um, we have to recess at about 5 till 10, and then we are going to go into session. After that, we have mandatory uh, harassment training. And then uh, when we're through with that, we will reconvene in hearing room 6, which is just right next door to us down the hall on the right-hand side. So I wanted to give everybody a, uh, an update because I don't think there's any way we can get through uh, the uh, yeah, well, and then uh, we, we'll, ha we'll have until um, 1. We'll have to be out of hearing room 6 by 1. But uh, we should be done with the regression training uh, 1130 to 12, somewhere in that time frame. Then we'll come straight down and, and uh, uh, reconvene. Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Representative Baker. To inquire. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, I'm so concerned about some of the things you mentioned here. Um, and it's it's something that, and I know we're in a specific, a very specific, talking about these recordings, but what I want to point out is the general behavior of our, our school administrators specifically in this situation, and how that this is not what education should be about, and how in my, and I'm going to ask you your, your thoughts on this, and I appreciate your, your braveness in, in, in doing this, and I know you I, do that. I do have the perk that my son is very, very part-time. I don't have to worry about retirement. We help but, school. But you're doing that because you care about the education oh, of sure. your child. And I compare, care about my community. In your situation, administrators were pitting parents against teachers to protect their own bad policy, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I mean, you can ask some other parents. I mean, yes. There's yes. nodding. Yes. yes. Yeah. Schools making it difficult for parents to fight for the education of their child should never happen. It should never happen. And that's what I'm seeing in this situation. Making it more difficult for a parent with disabilities and, and, and issues that need to be addressed so that they can be educated but making it more difficult for you to be able to fight for that education, to me, is absolutely inappropriate and unacceptable in our school systems that we're paying money to make sure that they're educating our children. And um, to me, again, I'm talking about an overall behavior here that I see happening and in, in, in your voicing that it's happening in your situation, but I've seen the same behavior in other areas in our state. And it's something that we are trying to fight for, and that's realizing that um, these, these kind of situations 
are a real problem when it comes to our education system and that we need options for parents like you. So now what I'm seeing is because of the way you were treated, because of the behavior of, of the school administrators in your school, you pulled your child out and said, you're, you're, you're not addressing the needs of my child. You're making it more difficult for me to try to help my, my child get educated properly. So now you're doing that at home right. at your own expense, right. correct? Well, we chose to homeschool two and a half Four years ago because my son was in a self-contained classroom and he's verbal and he had no other verbal peers and I said he needs friends who can talk and you're not putting him with his peers he's not going to lunch with him he's not going to recess with him this doesn't cut it and they just couldn't figure that out and I said okay then I'm just gonna pull him in homeschool that works for us and I can have him in a, in an inclusive environment and it's been great his speech you know, shot up and we were able to do more therapies. And so it's, it was work for us. It wasn't because of the recording or how I was treated. I mean, his teacher was wonderful. It's just how it's set up. And that's a whole other issue. But maybe exactly. one day we can talk about But that's there. also one of my points. Oh, I would love to take that one on. So thank you so much yeah. for your time and for what you have brought to us today. Any other questions? Great, thank you. Anybody else to testify in favor of? Thank you. My name is Amy Saladay. I'm an attorney in private practice in the state of Missouri. More important than being an attorney, I have two children with disabilities in the Columbia Public School System. I wrote some responses to some of the legal issues that came up, so just briefly, um, I'm one of the few parents in the Columbia Public School District that has permission to record my children's special education meetings. I've had four recorded meetings to date without an incident. The recorded meetings compared to what they were before when they were not recorded. They're more professional. The teachers come in prepared. They do a better job of explaining what they're saying. And when I get frustrated, I'm also less likely to say things that maybe I shouldn't say in response because I know that there's a record. It doesn't feel awkward. It doesn't feel uncomfortable. It feels like a very important meeting is taking place to figure out how to educate my child. There's a level of accountability that just wasn't present before. I use the recordings of my kids' special education meetings to listen back and understand what was said. I'm an attorney, but these meetings often involve teachers, principals, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, and school administrators using words that I don't understand. With respect to the unintended consequences, these meetings are emotional. I'm sitting in a room. We're talking about everything that my kids can't do. It's hard to focus. It's, like I, it's hard to focus on what the school team is saying. I don't understand all the terminology. We're talking about the Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. They're also talking about school terminology. I'm not a teacher. Um, everyone's talking fast because the teacher's gonna leave by 5 p.m. or it's a meeting that takes place at 7.30 a.m. and they only have a substitute teacher until 8.30 or 9. And so there's this massive pressure to talk fast, to get through the materials, and to get done. And I'm still in that meeting thinking about what my kids can't do. I can't imagine posting an audio or a video of one of those meetings. Uh, number one, it would be embarrassing because we're talking about everything that my kids can't do. And so my friends that have kids that are in regular education, they don't understand that. And I wouldn't want them to even to look at an audio or a video to really see the issues that we're talking about in terms of how are we going to help my kid be successful. I don't think anybody here cares about the video. I don't really want a video, but I do think that we want a recording. I also want to say that I hope that as legislators that you won't bargain over the best interests of our children and their educational future. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. With respect to some of the legal issues that were brought up, the special school district of St. Louis policy, I think that was the representative in the second row. We really hoped that you would just have this bill that's passed that says that schools can't prohibit recording and that you would leave it up to the local school districts to come up with their own policies. Um, with respect to the opposition to the bill, I think that the real reason there's opposition is that school districts don't want a record. They don't want the accountability. I've been in meetings where it was clear that there was a teacher who couldn't speak up 
There was also predetermination. They had decided before they came in what they were gonna do. That's never happened since recordings have been implemented. Now my experience in recorded meetings is I have teachers who are disagreeing on the record. And it's great because there's a record of what's being said and the teacher who disagrees can't be retaliated against by his or her administrator for speaking up about what's in the best interest of my kid. Um, Representative Finelli, Section 4, I think you accurately articulated it with respect to the retaliation piece in the bill. So I would just say I agree with what you said earlier. With respect to FERPA, if there are recordings, it's an educational record. Representative Prouty correctly stated that in terms of that the school's going to have to keep a copy, parents can request it. I would think that in any local school board policy, they're going to have to put something in there that says that the school's going to record also, and if the school records, the school's recording takes precedence over the parent's recording. And so that's how you would resolve the dispute over which one is the accurate recording. I told you about video. With respect to um, the law, there were some issues raised about, well, how can a school district do this? Well, legally, school districts are allowed, and they have the right to make more restrictive board policies. So unless you, as a legislative body, say, no, schools, you're going to follow Missouri's one-party recording law or one-party recording state, then I think you're going to see school districts continue to say that parents can't record. With respect to the example that Representative Prouty was talking about, there's litigation already coming out of Columbia Public Schools. So we already have issues where parents show up, they want to record, the school says no, or the school uses an excuse about, you didn't give us proper notice. There's this issue about, well, do you have to give 24 hours notice or seven days notice? Um, that's just being used to keep parents from being able to record. So in that situation, then the school terminates the meeting. There, there's case law, I researched this issue extensively, there's case law where school districts have had to sue parents because they are required to have that meeting under federal law. And so ultimately what happens is it forces the school to sue the parents because the parents want a recording. And so then you're in court and that poor child, they didn't get their, their IEP and their education plan for the year has not been made. And I think that's where the real rub is, is that many of us don't want to force our child into a situation where they're not going to get that individualized education plan. Without the plans for my kids, they wouldn't have learned how to read. So am I going to risk them not being able to learn how to read because I want to record a meeting? No. And then I, I did address the school board policies. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer questions. I did research this issue extensively. We tried to get Columbia Public Schools to get on board with this. I first made my request to record based on my husband's learning disability a year ago. So it's been an entire year that I've been asking Columbia Public Schools to allow all parents to be able to record their special education meetings. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Representative Pratt. To inquire, please. Sure. Proceed. Really quickly, I see in the board policy, as you mentioned, it says that um, requests for such exemptions to record must be made within a reasonable, per reasonable period of time uh, prior to the scheduled meetings. And you did mention that, you know, on occasion it's been three days, one day, a week, a month, what have you. They have not established a, a set time for what a reasonable amount of time is. And if you don't mind sharing, and I know you said you made it a year ago. Um, how long did it take for you to be able, or to, for you to get that approval to record your meetings? About three weeks. And then, you know, they're not uniformly applying. They don't have a very good policy, and what policy they do have with respect to the ADA exemption is not uniformly being applied. So we have some white parents who get to record, and we have black parents that don't. And we have some parents who request to record by email, like me, and I say, hey, look, here's my school board letter that says I have permission to record because of my husband's learning disability. And so they say, great, and they don't pay a lot of attention when I want to record because they know I'm going to. But I have other parents who send in the same notice within the same time frame, and they don't get to record. And I'm sure it's different when you're an attorney. It is. And, and there's an I think there's a real equity issue here. We have so many parents. So say mom can go to the IEP meeting. The IEP meeting's going to be during the regular work day. Dad can't, so dad doesn't get to be involved in his child's education. We have issues with transportation, issue, 
issues with child care and on the recording, you know, I'm privileged, I'm an attorney, I can go in there, I can buy a recorder, I can store it, but not every parent can. And I, I had a parent advocate working with me. It was really her that said, you need to ask for permission to record. I was in an IEP meeting, it was over a year ago. My husband has a learning disability. It was intimidating. There were 10 people at a table. Every person but my husband had a laptop and was taking notes. And we're in the middle of this meeting and he says, you know, I don't know what you guys are saying. I don't understand what you're saying. And I can't take notes at the same time while I'm listening to you speak. He said, all I know is I can tell you how my daughter learns because I have the same dyslexia and the same learning disability that you do. And he said, but I can't do what you all are doing. You're typing, you're taking notes, and you're talking. And it was very hard for him. And there were no accommodations that were offered. And there was no acknowledgement of the fact that he was the only person in the room that didn't have a laptop and that couldn't take notes and actively participate sure. at the same time. And I appreciate you noting equity, and because that is a huge deal. When I was a school counselor right before I came here, I was in one of the not accredited, fully accredited schools, and that was an issue. And so I know a lot of people were taken aback about the length of time these IEP meetings can last. They last that long, especially when you're, you're concerned about making sure parents really understand what we're saying and explaining some of this, you know, high level, very difficult language when they have questions. And so those meetings can go just like this meeting, right? You would think it was a quick go through, but when we're talking to parents who really want to understand and be able to help their children, you, you, you get those long meetings. You, and, you, and I'm even privileged. There's not there's a difference between going in there as an educator and as a school counselor who was responsible for IEPs and not knowing something right. And I didn't say that to be funny. It's so different now that I'm gonna say even the meeting from last year to this year is a different meeting for me. Um, in that you know my you can be crazy do what he wants you know to do because it, 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 and it is different. So I definitely appreciate you reiterating the fact that that equity piece um, is a huge deal for, for parents and who gets to record and who doesn't and it, X, Y, and Z. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And the um, uh, essence of time. Uh, is there anybody here for um, informational purposes only? Okay. So yeah, so we have about, come on forward. Um, we have about eight minutes, um, and we want to try to wrap this. Did you, did, is there another witness in favor of? Okay. Oh, several. Okay. So we'll bring them back. Okay. So we'll go with you, and then um, just go ahead, and we'll see how see how quickly you go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I'm Chad McLaurin, representing uh, Race Potter's Friends. Uh, it's a local Columbia-based uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, we got involved with uh, Columbia Public Schools and looked at their policies as well, and I think this is, uh, the bill as proposed is a great step forward. Um, I think that it's uh, limited in scope, and I'd actually like to see more aggressive measures taken. Um, everything that's been talked about so far has to fall under the IDA program and uh, student with disabilities. Um, we have other uh, demographics that work here as well. I, I think that you know, when we look at um, the, the sessions, I think we also need to include disciplinary meetings. Because like a lot of times, if you have that one-on-one -on -one or put on the committee or whoever you're, you're working with, um, a, a lot of it is kind of like fact-finding and sharing and trying to come to a consensus about what, what's the best behavior going forward. And a lot of it has to do, um, it does tie in directly with students with, um, with disabilities because a lot of them are behavioral disabilities. Um, you have a lot of overlap between other demographics. Um, for example, in um, Columbia, I know that the disparity between out-of-school suspensions for black students is two to three times the, the norm for white students um, based upon the population. And I realize that not every um, town is going to have the same issue because of just the, the population density and so on and so forth. Um, I would also like to see that this is uh, extended beyond just the school districts. And this needs to be covered in charter schools. This needs to be charted in like uh, private schools and church-run schools. Because bottom line, this is this is about child safety and about um, basically addressing the issues and not trying to reintroduce more and more trauma to these children. What is this? What is the mandate that they have to attend an educational facility? So if they're being mandated and we're entrusting our children to care of these organizations, they need to be governed by the exact same rules. Um, 
there's another issue that we've had. Um, you have your alternative centers for education uh, programs, and I know like with CPS, Columbia Public School Systems, they will oftentimes refer students to them when they kind of get tired of the student, I think is really what it comes down to. And they kind of defer to their policies. So, I mean, it's kind of a hands-off, we trust this organization, they're just gonna take care of the kids. Uh, these third parties need to be regulated by the same uh, standards. So, uh, uh, again, the, uh, my big thing is I think that schools should be mandated that they have to record audio. Uh, it might be an issue of like um, parents and children might move state to state or city to city. It'd be good to have a record you take with you. Um, I, I think there's some salient points up here as well in terms of um, just comparing. Like if you have like something that can come up and you're um, had questions about, you need to research on your own time. But you also might need to get like more um, legal opinion or specialist opinion to kind of bounce that out. And worst case scenario, if you find something that was like misspoken, um, depending on the degree of severity of how poorly that was represented, that can serve as a training tool in house and as a re review so that we can correct policies and make sure that ultimately what we should be focusing on is the child's development. And um, I, I think a lot of times the administration kind of loses sight of that. Any questions for the witness? Representative Bates. Well, thank you for being here, sir. I just, are you an attorney? No, sir. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to visit with you about that. I, I, since this is my bill, I'd I kind of like to leave it as is and maybe discuss entertaining, um, you know, your request a little separately. If that, we could do that. Sure. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we will be in hearing room six, hearing room uh, six when and, we uh, reconvene. We don't know the exact time between 1130 yeah, and 12. Yeah, as soon as our uh, harassment training is uh, finished, we will reconvene. Yes. In, uh, HR six right next door. Okay. And we need to kind of limit it. Don't be repetitive if you keep running on what's been already said. And because uh, we still have another bill to get through, and we'd really like to finish by. We have to be out of here by one p.m. Thank you. things, um, especially because my meetings can be up to like two hours long, sometimes that's the minimum. Um, also, being that I am partially deaf, it is hard for me to hear everything that's discussed. Um, it's hard for me to take notes quickly, um, or as fast as the discussion goes, um, and I also have a hard time processing some information um, very quickly, and that's also part of my condition. Um, so when a meeting is recorded, it could certainly help in the event that maybe I can't remember if a necessary accommodation was discussed, um, and then by going back to the recording, I can make sure that I will get it. Um, also, it could help me identify if something was like maybe missing from the document, or you know, just anything. Um, that would need to be added or revised, um, or even in the unfortunate event that perhaps there's a dispute with the school over what was discussed, a recording would easily resolve that. Um, and so I would like to show my support for this bill because it would re only require me to give 24 hours notice to the school that I um, would like to record, um, which would greatly re reduce the likelihood that there would be a problem such as a cancellation of the meeting. Um, and to kind of give an example of that, um, recently I had an IEP meeting scheduled um, and it had been 
scheduled for a long time. Um, I requested to record the meeting, um, and unfortunately, my communication had been cut off from uh, school and district employees because my email was deactivated. Uh, and so I could not make that request on my own, so my mom did so on my behalf. Uh, as a result, the meeting was canceled, and the district cited the fact that I did not submit a print paper request form uh, as their reasoning for doing so. And now we have to reschedule this meeting, and um, before long, the district will be out of compliance, actually, um, for not having the IEP submitted in um, the required window of time. Um, and I also need this IEP done immediately because I have to have that in order to move on to a transition program at Missouri School for the Blind. Uh, they cannot accept me until the IEP uh, has been finished, and um, that program is essential because it will help me learn things that I should have gotten at my school, but that they were unable to provide me with. Um, so going back to the bill, um, I think this is some very positive legislation that will help uh, individuals with disabilities um, have a level playing field and um, allow them to be equally involved in the IEP process. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. Is there anyone here to testify in support of the bill for informational purposes? Good evening. Hi, my name is Lakeisha Jackson. I live in Boone County. I have a son who is in sixth grade in Columbia Public Schools. He has an IEP. The recording policy KKB and procedures used at CPS discriminate against me. I'm a parent with a disability and I need to record these meetings. The board policy has no discussion of ADA, which has been around for 30 years. CPS has never accommodated for my disability so that I can participate in meaningful in my son's IEP. The school year of in the school year at in October 2019 IEP, I tried to openly record under the ADA. I was told I had to fill out a form to request it. So I filled out the form and brought it to the IEP meeting. The special educator director refused to take the form and would not allow me to record. I filled in Office of Civil Rights complaint on the discrimination. I should not, it shouldn't be this hard. The ADA and state law should protect me on this, but the school is hiding behind a bad policy. I support this bill so that I can have meaningful participation in my son's IT. Thank you for your time and the important issue for the future of Missouri children. Thank you very much, ma'am. Is there any questions for the witness? Thank you so much. Okay, next witness. Hello. My name is Susan Goldhammer. I'm an Associate Executive Director at the Missouri School Boards Association, which is just a fancy name for I'm one of the staff attorneys. Um, and I am here to testify for information purposes only. Um, it's my understanding that there's been a lot of testimony regarding uh, our policy KKB. 
So I've brought several copies just in case anybody actually wants to read the policy and I'll put them here in this basket. Um, and I'm just here to explain why the policy reads the way it does uh, today. Uh, this policies, uh, although the policy itself has changed quite a bit, um, uh, is periodically updated. Um, this area of the law is uh, continuously evolving. We're in very interesting times about uh, dealing with personal privacy, recording social media, um, uh, and school districts have to balance a lot of its interests when it comes to that. Uh, uh, I think it might be a generational thing, um, uh, or not, we'll see in the next 10 or 20 years how this goes. Um, but right now, uh, we have a policy that limits recording on school grounds for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have, we're dealing with very sensitive uh, situations. We have parents that are very upset if their kids are recorded without their knowledge. Um, uh, we have situations that are not uh, pleasant, like student fights that are showing up on social media, and people don't want to see that. And so for that reason, we have a policy that limits audio and video recording. But even before we had this policy, um, we've had language in our special education policy um, that prohibited um, recording of uh, IEP meetings and 504 meetings unless required by law. Um, we've always had that unless required by law because there could be a situation where somebody has a disability and needs a recording as accommodation. And this, uh, that language was moved into this policy when we kind of combined all of our recording things. Um, the federal law, you know, special education law does not require or even address uh, recording. And in fact, I have um, a letter from the United States Department of Education stating that, and I'll just provide that for information only. Um, but the real reason, uh, and if you notice, the policy talks about not just IEP and 504 meetings, but any communications between the district and parents. Um, uh, the purpose of the special education law, um, IDEA, which, you know, I don't know how many of you know what an IEP is. I think that's an assumption, but federal law, it's a major civil rights law, both 504 and um, IDEA um, were put into effect to make sure that um, students with disabilities receive a quality education. And as that law has evolved, um, that in particular the IDEA has created processes that require school districts and parents to sit down and talk things out. And it's been a, actually a very wildly successful law. And that portion of the law is very um, crucial to the law um, because these are sometimes about highly emotional issues. Um, parents need, uh, are concerned about their child, want the best of education. Um, and the law, in several respects, makes the school district and the parents sit down and communicate together, create a plan, which is called the IEP, or if we're talking about Section 504, a 504 plan, um, that focuses on the needs of the child. And the point is, is we need to be focusing on the child, not the adults, the children, okay? Many people are not comfortable speaking while they're being recorded, and that's just a fact, okay? They're worried they'll sound silly. They're worried their words will be used out of context. They're worried that their voice will show up on social media. They're worried that it will be used against them in a lawsuit, and lawsuits aren't frivolous. Uh, one of the main reasons school districts get sued is under um, special ed law. Uh, in fact, we have a couple of law firms that that is all they do is they defend public school districts in the state of Missouri um, in litigation involving special education students. So it's not irrelevant to school districts. Um, it is true. Anything that prevents someone from speaking up in these meetings is a concern because the point is, is we're supposed to be talking about the child. We're supposed to be talking about what we're worried about, what we see. We're supposed to be brainstorming, drawing out ideas, um, anything that causes anyone to hesitate um, in those meetings uh, is a concern. And so that's why we have written it in the policy. The point I want to make 
um, in particular as an attorney that represents school districts is we have an obligation to ensure that parents have a meaningful opportunity to participate in the meeting and not after the meeting a day later if parents need supports to understand what is happening in the meeting then school districts need to be taking that time to spend with the, the parents in the meeting while the decisions are being made um, to make sure that they understand them okay taking the recording and going home and listening to it and understanding it later is too late parents need to understand while they're in the meeting and so that has kind of been our focus is in order for parents to meaningfully participate in the creation of these plans they need to understand while they're in the meeting and school districts need to be doing um, their job on that end and if we're not then that was that's really what we need to be focusing on um, but at any rate I'm just here to explain why the policy is written the way it is right now um, we will of course abide every year when legislation is passed we review all of our policy in comparison with the legislation and we'll make changes if necessary are there any questions Professor Bailey. hey good morning or good afternoon uh, so if you abide by um, the state law we're a one party state for uh, recording so why are how explain to me how a school board's decision trumps state law that's why we're here it's already on the books but the school board association says no 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 we're going to be the the lawmakers if you will policy and it's not statute policy and you're telling parents they can't although it's already in state law that's why we're here today so explain to me how a school board association policy trumps state law that we already have we are one party consent recording state that's an excellent question and the first of all let me make sure you understand the missouri school boards association is a volunteer association school districts not every school district in the state belongs to us a service that we provide is we provide sample policies we don't run school districts in the state we don't dictate to school districts in the state as a resource for our member districts we provide samples and in fact we have a service that if a district pays us a little bit more we'll help them customize if they need that help okay so isn't it a little bit misleading though to say we review all the laws and we abide by them and then the next statement is well here's our policy I've read the policy I've read what you passed out I've read it it prohibits what is actually lawful so I think that's the problem and the crux of the issue why we're here today many parents don't know that honestly I didn't know that so well, till today and you know that you have concerns that uh, the teachers administrators school board everybody has concerns about it tough there are kids we're the taxpayers so we don't care that you have concerns you're gonna have to deal with it because it's already law and so again that we're here today it, it's it's already it's already law so um and i if you weren't here earlier this t this morning you know we had an hour or so of um testimony it's parents i have a kiddo with an iep for the first three years you missed my small story i didn't even hear the iep because i was upset um and dealing with it so that i couldn't that you say that i can't go home later that it's too late that is ridiculous do you know the alphabet soup that we get an IEP I mean there's so much to, and I mean I've gotten stacks and you know I look at it and just pray to God that you know but my school district did a wonderful job the teachers are angels the therapists are angels but there are many school districts that don't have that and you know at that time I wasn't of mind to even think about a recording or whatever I just trusted them um, and I, I it worked out however I think many parents in the room find it um, rude and hurtful that we're paying our tax dollars and that you would say it's too late when we go home. That is ridiculous. And I know many women in this room and dads that, I don't know if you have a child with disabilities, but it's not easy. It's not easy. And sitting in a room where, you know, you have professionals and specialists, that's wonderful, 
But dear God, what we're thinking is, holy crap, is my kid going to be okay? Really, that's all we're thinking. So I would ask you to maybe pull off this policy and let the school districts, let the parents do what they want because we're paying the bill. And we really get sick and tired of associations putting down policy when there's already law, promulgating rules when there's already law, and something different happening. I apologize. I didn't mean to offend you. I do. You want don't to make offend me. Point. You you offend the taxpayers in this room that are here that came to say, "Let me record a darn meeting so I can go home later and figure out what the heck they said," because we are worried about our kids. And if we're really if, if we're having a meaningful opportunity for parents to um, to have a conversation, believe me, we don't feel like it's a a, um, a blessing that you're letting us come in. We, we just want transparency. Government, transparency is for government, and that's what we want. I do want to make a point about the one uh, person recording. What that means is that it is not a crime if one person secretly records another person. Okay? So the, the states that do have uh, the two recording policies, it's a crime if that happens. So what you're saying is is that it's not a crime in Missouri for parents to secretly record meetings with staff members. But what our policy is based on is goes broader than what is criminal, okay? We still have a lot of people, including parents. I mean, I would have a lot of parents that would be very upset if a principal secretly recorded a conference with them, okay? Um, and so for that reason, we have a policy that goes beyond what the law allows. It's not a crime, but the real question in our policy and for our school districts to decide is, is it right? What should happen in schools, okay? And so when you say the one-party consent law, what that means is that it's not a crime for one person without the consent of the other person to record, it's not a crime, but that doesn't mean that um, uh, it, sh it should be the rule. And that's why we put the policy this way. Now, obviously you disagree. And the, I'm just here for information purposes only. If the legislature changes the law, uh, we will certainly change our policy to reflect what that law is. Okay, thank you, uh, Representative Brown. Just a point of information. Um, when you hear someone say that they don't, they want the parents included in the meeting and to participate, they don't want it afterwards. Let's remember that you take this recording home, listen to it, and then reconvene the IEP meeting. So that's really important for parents who are stuck in the middle of 10 educators and they know nothing. As an educator myself, I can tell you sitting around a table with 10 other educational employees, whereas with all cards on the table, I was the pres union president, it was still daunting for our folks. So understand that IEPs can, I just want other people in this room to understand, you can reconvene that meeting after you take that tape on the listen to it. Thank you. Representative Morgan, proceed. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, do you represent the special school district? Are they part of your association? They're a member district, yeah. They're what? They are a member district. Okay. Um, do they have a policy on recordings? I have been told that they use our policy. Okay, they use your policy and, and uh, I, okay. And, I'm not on their board, so. And, and, and they, I mean, I have been told that there are times when the, the special ed conferences, the IEP conferences, are recorded in the special ed district. Is that something you would agree with, or you think it's true? I I have been told that. Yeah. Okay. So so they so they actually do record, and they use your policy to back them up. I or they use your policy. I I have been told that. Yes. Okay. I, okay. I haven't done specific research for a special. Okay, so that doesn't preclude them from, from doing the recording. Their policy doesn't. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any other questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you. Okay, you got it. Mr. Sullivan, do you want to? Okay. 
Please try not to be repetitive if you can. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Becky Usallo, and I would like to voice my support for House Bill 1540. As a public school teacher for the past 23 years, I am rarely able to attend IEP meetings of my students. Um, in order to do so, I have to find a teacher to cover my classes, and that is practically impossible. If I had access to a recording of the meeting, I could hear for myself what had been discussed. My teams are very good to send me IEPs and 504 plans in a timely fashion, but that, that does not replace the discussion of which I cannot be a part. As a parent of a student that used to attend public schools, I would have greatly valued recording my daughter's IEP meetings. Many times there were at least 10 teachers, therapists, and administrators. We would take notes, but I'm confident that having a recording to review would have been very helpful. Thank you for your consideration, and thank you for this opportunity to express my support. Thank you so much, ma'am. Any questions for the witness? Thank you so much. Thanks for your patience. Uh, anyone else to testify? Hi, my name is Sherilyn Romp. I'll make this short and sweet. Um, and then probably send an email out. Um, I just wanted to say that I am fully in support of being able to record laws. Um, just kind of briefly about my story is um, I have a daughter who's paralyzed from the neck down on a ventilator. And uh, 11 years ago, and we've been in Jeff City School District for 10 years, and a lot of the stuff that's happened in other districts, unfortunately, the last year of school for my daughter, she was verbally and mentally abused. Um, they would say one thing in one meeting, something else in the second meeting, to the point it caused, um, the, they would say one thing in one meeting, something different in the next, to the point it was so upsetting to her, caused um, major anxiety and uh, panic attacks of going unresponsive. Um, unfortunately, we lost her in May um, due to some of these issues, and I think had we been able to record our meetings, and held the school district responsible for what was being said for her education. I think a lot of this would not have happened, but I think it's important for, you know, I hear a lot of negative negativity about worrying about people being able to retaliate. We were retaliated against, and I think by recording, it helps to hold the school district accountable, the teachers accountable, and the parents accountable as well. And that way we're all on the same page, and like we heard earlier today, if everyone's being recorded and they know they're being recorded, then things are going to be doing right. And if we are there for our children and for their education, we should be doing what's right from them to beginning, from the very beginning. So thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Is there any questions for uh, the witness? Sorry. Okay, we're very sorry that happened to you, ma'am. All right, any, anybody else? My name is Laura Wakefield. I am from Boone County and I live in Columbia, Missouri. And I am an advocate for people who have disabilities and I specialize in helping families navigate the very confusing process of special education. I support them in meetings and help them understand their rights under IDEA, ADA, and Section 504. I wanted to just give you some information related to the question about special school district. I have an email from Mark Jim, the political director of m &E and he said that special school district does have that policy and he forwarded it to me and I just want to read it to you and I can then forward it on to the committee. So just so we have that answer. And it states, parent, this, it's pretty simple. Parents wishing to create an audio, visual, or other recording of any meeting between district employees and parents slash guardians, including but not limited to meetings held pursuant to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, will inform the organizer of the meeting of their request to do so prior to the meeting. If a parent guardian records a meeting, the district will also do so. The resulting recording will become part of the student's educational record. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions for Ms. Whitefield? Okay, appreciate it. And remind everybody that if you testify, please fill out a witness form. Thank you. 
So uh, this will be for informational purposes. My name is Bill Gamble. I represent the special school district. And to be very succinct, uh, as the previous witness said for MNEA, but I'm speaking for the district itself, the superintendent and uh, the Board of Education, uh, IDA already says that districts can't prohibit this. Our policy always allows meetings to be recorded according to law. Uh, this bill doesn't make any change to our current policy. This is our policy. So I thought I'd provide that clarity um, to the discussion. And I'm going to apologize to uh, Representative Bailey. I just got this, and I will have some comments on your bill, but certainly next bill that I I apologize, I always talk to people before I have a present testimony, so my apologies. So I thought I'd get a two for in. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Gamble? You're an information only? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, okay. I, I guess we would, you'd say we are neutral because we already did it. So. Okay. Do we? Thanks, sir. Yes. Okay, any other uh, testimony uh, on this bill? All right, it looks like that concludes the uh, hearing on House Bill 1540. And uh, hold on just uh, one second.